Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. On behalf of Abralin, I'd like to welcome and thank Professor Stefan Gries for accepting our invitation to participate in the series of lives Abralin ao Vivo, Linguists Online, promoted by the Brazilian Association of Linguistics in cooperation with the Permanent International Committee of Linguists, the Latin American the Latin American Association of Linguistics, the Argentine Society of Linguistic Studies, the Linguistic Society of America, the Linguistics Association of Great Britain, and the Australian Linguistic Society. We also thank Thradu Points for providing simultaneous translation to Portuguese. I'm Fernanda Canever. I hold a PhD in linguistics from the University of Sao Paulo, and I have recently completed a postdoc fellowship Fellowship at the State University of Campinas. Today, we have the pleasure to listen to Professor Stefan Ries, who is a full professor at the Department of Linguistics at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and chair of English Linguistics, Corpus Linguistics with a focus on quantitative methods at the Department of English of the Justus Liebig Universität Gießen in Germany. Professor Gries is a quantitative corpus linguist at the intersection of corpus linguistics, cognitive linguistics, and computational linguistics, and uses a variety of different statistical methods to investigate linguistic topics. He has published extensively in numerous leading international peer-reviewed journals, and among his publications are Quantitative Corpus Linguistics with R, a practical introduction, and Statistics for Linguistics with R, which now has a Brazilian Portuguese translation, Estatística com R para Linguística. Both textbooks have influenced and inspired many linguists around the world to dive into the world of quantitative methods with R, myself included. There is also an upcoming practical handbook on corpus linguistics in general and implementation of all sorts of corpus methods and statistics in R. So the title of his lecture today is The Versatility of Quantitative Corpus Linguistics. Professor Gries, I hand it over to you now. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just set up the screen sharing. <clears throat> Second. All right, hello everybody. Um, I would first like to uh, thank the organizers of this uh, for inviting me uh, to do this. Obviously in these times, you know, travel and everything is not very well possible. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to reach uh, a wider audience uh, in this particular way. Um, the, what I wanna talk about today, you know, as you can see is kind of a very general, a very overview kind of talk. Uh, so the title, you know, versatility of quantitative corpus linguistics and then examples from a variety of different areas. I basically want to showcase, you know, um, a variety of domains to which quantitative corpus linguistics can contribute. Um, in particular, you know, looking at a, a variety of different uh, linguistic subdisciplines, but also a variety of different kinds of methods and you know, different degrees of statistical sophistication, ranging from very, very simple to maybe not quite that simple. And so the first case study will be one on Spanish internet orthography. Uh, in particular on how users of Spanish on the internet use letter deletion and repetition to achieve different communicative goals while they're at the same time reacting to um, a variety of different kinds of forces, articulatory, sociolinguistic, and pragmatic ones, for instance. Uh, the second case study then involves auditory data and involves the question of whether speakers signal ends of turns to hearers by means of turn final lengthening. And so what in that study we looked at was duration measurements from a spoken corpus and we did some mixed effects modeling kind of stuff and corresponding visualization to, you know, explore that kind of question. And then uh, the last two case studies are for that area of uh, legal or forensic linguistics. Um, and so in a sense, they're more applied. <clears throat> I'll first discuss a little bit of, uh, of how very elementary corpus linguistic tools, concordancing and maybe some other things, you know, depending on how we're going for time. Um, have the potential to make the interpretation of legal texts, uh, so statutes, laws, uh, constitutions, um, and so on, more objective and in some sense, you know, fairer and more useful. And then the second example will be um, 
a little case study from a recent lawsuit where I provided expert witness testimony in an authorship attribution case using sort of relatively simple corpus methods and then some multifactorial modeling. So that's kind of the overview. And again, the idea is to give a uh, give an overview of you know what are all the different kinds of areas and ways in which quantitative corpus methods can be used to look at you know very different kinds of things, and also with very different degrees of impact. You know, ivory tower to you know maybe not so much. All right. So about the first case study, um, <coughs> it's about different kinds of forms of communication, in particular computer mediated communication. And so these kinds of new technologies, you know, have always influenced the form of communication. Uh, we've added new ways of communicating. We've modified existing ones. And of course, in computer-mediated communication, that's particularly obvious. You know, we've we've gotten a variety of new words that we didn't have. You know, things like that by now, of course, are well known. You know, CC, blog, things like that. We have new abbreviations and acronyms, uh, such as the ones listed here. Um, we have the simple set of emoticons, which by now, you know, is getting a little bit out of fashion again, obviously, uh, at least among certain age groups, I guess. And so what I want to talk about today is uh, something that's in linguistic often considered a little bit peripheral, uh, namely orthography, and in particular, uh, what one might want to call, you know, speller morphy <clears throat> and other variation in lexical items. And the target will be, you know, social networking and blogging in Internet Spanish. <clears throat> now, for those of you who feel that they are more sensitive, this uh, warning here at the top is there for a reason. Uh, so for, the, for those of you who are not from the US, you know, so this is a parental guidance kind of warning, uh, alerting you to the fact that uh, there will be, I think, two or three slides with strong language. So the, um, <clears throat> be on the lookout for this because this will show up again. So if you're easily offended, you know, then there's two or three slides uh, where you might not want to read too closely. Okay, so <clears throat> this paper is based on a project that uh, a former undergraduate student uh, in my corpus course and I did and has been published in Literary and Linguistic Computing. Uh, we looked at uh, Spanish as one of the most widely used languages on the web, but the amount of work on Internet Spanish doesn't really reflect <clears throat> the um, very widespread uh, frequency of Internet Spanish or Spanish on the Internet at all. Uh, there's really, you know, not even a lot of good overviews of this, or in particular with regard to orthography. Uh, to give you an example of what we had in mind when we did this way back then, um, you know, here's an example. Um, <clears throat> so the black, uh, <clears throat> the black lines are how you would write something in, you know, standard Spanish spelling, and then the green version is what you might find on the internet, or what we did find on the internet at one point. Okay, and I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to read Spanish because I don't speak it. Um, but if you have a look, I mean, you can very clearly see uh, at least some patterns in here that um, <clears throat> deviate uh, <clears throat> in the neutral sense, you know, from the standard spelling. Um, and critically, you know, the Spanish internet orthography is not a rigid one to one grapheme mapping. Um, and in fact, it's not even, you know, regular all the time in the sense that, you know, every word in standard spelling you know, will have a corresponding uh, one and only one corresponding equivalent, uh, as you can see here. <clears throat> so the same word in the standard spelling, you know, had, receives two different orthography versions, you know, in, in one in the same sentence by one in the same speaker um, here in the internet orthography. Um, <clears throat> so again, it's not a rigid one-to-one -one mapping, but it's still a rule governed uh, rule in the sense of regularity. And I wanna talk about some of these. <clears throat> so what we're going to look at is uh, two different uh, kinds of phenomena. One is a deletion or omission phenomenon, and the other one is concerned with the repetition. Uh, <clears throat> so for deletion or omission, we're going to look at the reduction of word final ado, ado to ao, uh, something that happens in uh, colloquial Spanish, in particular in Andalusian Spanish, all the time anyway. And you can see a few examples here where the question mark is used in the sort of you know, regular expression kind of sense, meaning that the immediately preceding character is optional. So indicating, you know, that D uh, may or may not be there. And then the second example is simple repetition. So uh, characters are repeated. And again, you see a few examples here, uh, you know, where a bunch of A's are repeated here at the end of this word, a bunch of O's are repeated here, you know, something, <clears throat> something like that. So that, that's what we're going to look at. And we did so in a corpus that we created uh, from various forums or social networking sites, video sharing sites, and so on. 
um, and uh, Mark did this back in the day using a version of an R script that uh, we developed from uh, the first edition of my corpus textbook that I was using in the class back then. And so we went to a variety of uh, you know, websites, uh, which you see listed here, and then looked at the comments or the descriptions or the viewer discussions uh, on these websites, um, crawling them, basically putting them up into a corpus. Uh, we tried to make sure that we do sample different dialects uh, using, for instance, things like search by uh, country features. Um, we also did uh, use search by language features and things like that so that we get at least a little bit of a spread. And then as a reference corpus, we use the well-known Corpus del Español uh, that Mark Davies uh, has made available. <clears throat> so if you look at this kind of deletion in these, uh, you know, mostly parse participle forms, um, then these voice stops, you know, a lot of times they can be spirantized, they can be deleted completely, uh, in particular, you know, in the onset of an unstressed syllable or in rapid or informal speech. And the D is really the most affected segment there. Uh, and one study back in the day, you know, that really um, looked at this, it seems like systematically the very first time was the study by the 3 2002. Um, in this study, we only looked at the auto form without feminine or plural inflected variants. Um, and then, of course, we also discarded a variety of forms, namely uh, things that end in IO, you know, in standard Spanish anyway, uh, words that occurred more than five times, uh, five times or more often in the Corpus del Español with AO, but not with the other form, and, you know, proper names, um, <coughs> Portuguese words and other things like that. And then we first wanted to make sure that the one previous study, you know, Listerie was kind of comparable to what we had. So uh, we checked uh, what we found, the frequency distributions in our data uh, with uh, his earlier data. Uh, although his earlier data were actually from chat data, so they were a little bit more interactive than uh, the kind of uh, viewer comments and discussions in a, you know, YouTube thread or something like that uh, than we had. And so we had uh, approximately 1,600 types of these words, uh, approximately 700 of which were also attested with an AO, so with a reduced form, um, looking like this. And so then we uh, looked at basically, okay, what, what's the kind of distribution that we found in our SIO corpus, so Spanish Internet Orthography Corpus, and what's the corresponding distribution in that uh, study from eight years ago at the time, you know, um, looking at chat data. And there was actually no real difference in terms of frequency between these patterns uh, for the italicized words. So while there is a difference in interactivity between the two registers, basically, that we were sampling here, um, it doesn't seem to do much for de-deletion, at least, you know, on the most coarse grained resolution frequency of occurrence. So what do we do with this? Um, well, we identified the 50 most frequent words um, that were attested with both of these forms and uh, their standard spellings. And then for each of these word types, we constructed uh, this kind of uh, table, which to many people doing corpus stuff will look, uh, you know, really familiar um, as a kind of like a keywords or association measure table. Basically, those are all the same, uh, you know, and <clears throat> we basically looked, uh, you know, for a certain word, which is listed here, you know, how often is it attested in each of the two corpora and how often is it, is it attested with each of these uh, spellings. You know, and then the focus, of course, was on, you know, how much does the uh, reduced form, so the blue 91 here out of the 662 in the internet corpus, you know, how does it differ from the here, very obviously, you know, huge difference from the distribution of, you know, that same word spelt without a D in the uh, standard reference corpus uh, out of, you know, a much larger number of items. So we determined the percentage of D deletion, which here, obviously, um, you know, this is approximately one seventh, you know, 30, 91 is 13.75% out of 662. And obviously this one is a tiny percentage. Um, and then we represent this in a kind of scatter plot, um, which uh, looks like this. So on the X axis, we have uh, the logged word frequency in both corpora combined. <clears throat> okay, on the Y axis, uh, we have the logged percentage of the owl form, so the, the deleted one. So words that you see here at the top, you know, those are words that have really high percentages of deletion. Words you see at the bottom, maybe, you know, have none actually plotted here at pretty much exactly zero. And then it's like this, so the plotted word, you know, that represents the percentage of de-deletion in the internet corpus. 
and then the line connecting to a diamond further down, you know, the diamond is the corresponding deletion frequency in the uh, uh, reference corpus. Now, what do we see? Uh, so unsurprisingly, D deletion is more frequent in the internet corpus. You know, there's very few lines that go up, you know, from a word to a diamond, uh, not exactly surprising. Um, at the same time, you know, the deletion doesn't happen indiscriminately. So there's a, a little bit of a frequency effect on the whole. You know, you can see that, I mean, if you were to draw a line through this, like a regression line, you know, it would probably go down a little bit like this. Um, and you can also see it, you know, like if you look at the left side of the scatter plot, there's a variety of words, you know, up here in the 90% or something. If you go to the right half of that scatter plot, nothing's higher than 20%. Um, <clears throat> so there's definitely a frequency effect. And, you know, if you're coming from a usage-based or, you know, um, exemplar-based kind of perspective, you know, that may be explainable with some reference to notions like entrenchment and something like that, which makes people fall back on standard orthography. Um, at the same time, there's a little bit of a phonological effect, uh, which I'm not going to talk about much now, but I do want to talk about a pragmatics effect, uh, which is, let me show this here, um, <laughs> the most frequent words, uh, so the ones on the left, uh, on the right, that did not exhibit much deletion, uh, those are also not good words to exhibit, you know, coolness or hipness or social group affiliation or something like that. And that's simply because, you know, words that are really, really frequent uh, you know, to take two English examples, you know, bean or in, you know, it's not really cool or hip, you know, if you change them if, by misspelling them, you know, that doesn't really buy you very much uh, in terms of uh, social capital, but there is an interaction. Um, and that one was quite interesting to see. So even the most boring words uh, in terms of their content otherwise, and maybe, uh, yeah, in, in terms of what they refer, you know, they do exhibit deletion if they have already been modified in some other way. Okay, so the kind of spelling modification that one can see, you know, those, those can cluster. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, so we have the spelling like this, um, which is a normal one. And in that, uh, if the word looks like this, then deleting the D happens relatively infrequently, only in 7.22%. But if the word has already been made um, big air quotes here, you know, but cool or hip or something uh, by exchanging, um, the S uh, for the C here. So the word has already been messed with, so to speak, then suddenly the deletion of D uh, increases by a factor of, uh, I mean, incre increases to threefold. Okay, so it seems like, you know, people are keeping track on a probably somewhat unconscious level, you know, okay, that word is boring. Okay, I'm not gonna do anything with that, with the D, but this one's already been made more interesting. Uh, you know, I've messed with the C uh, and so, uh, the D at the end, you know, can maybe also be deleted uh, in some way. Or, you know, the plan was to delete the, uh, to put the C in there for the S so that let me do something else with that as well. Now, there's also uh, an effect of uh, vulgarity. And so this is one of the first slides that has a few words on there that not everyone might like. Um, so we looked at vulgarities uh, among the words on the top of our list. And it turns out, you know, those are cool words, I guess. Uh, you know, because they uh, exhibit a very high proportion of D-deletion. And so <clears throat> the six forms with the highest proportions of D-deletion at all, uh, some of which actually only occur with deletion, are the following. And so uh, invert your eyes or don't listen for a second. Uh, you know, we have three words that occur both in the Spanish Internet Orthography Corpus and the Corpus de l'Espanol, which are these, and that have extremely high uh, proportions of D-deletion. Um, and in particular, the third one is a really, really great example um, of how people really, really keep track of a lot of things at the same time. Uh, so that word, you know, you can see the two meanings there if you're reading. Uh, it's interesting that in the, uh, when that word has the first meaning, the harmless one, uh, you know, ice cream, then D deletion is rare because, you know, that word meaning ice cream, you know, who cares? That's not cool. If it has the other meaning, uh, then suddenly the de deletion skyrockets. Okay, so uh, even uh, so, people keep track of which words are cool, but even which word senses are cool because with those, then deletion goes up. And then here's uh, three other pretty vulgar words uh, that were only attested in the Internet Orthography Corpus. Uh, and again, you can see, you know, those will score high on any kind of vulgarity scale you come up with, and they had extremely high versions, uh, extremely high frequencies. Uh, in the spelling uh, that did not involve the D. 
Most words that occurred exclusively, exclusively without the D deletion in internet orthography have pretty formal meanings or functions. And you can see uh, a few uh, examples of those here, right? I mean, <clears throat> again, I don't speak Spanish, but you know, something like significado, confirmado, those are relatively formal words, you know, uh, relatively long words. So those are ones that you do not mess around with by deleting the D because it's just not cool. Um, we also had a brief look at, you know, vulgarities listed in dictionary and basically the, uh, the findings were the same. Uh, you know, there was a deletion rate of approximately 20% of non-vulgar words, uh, but of 85% of the vulgar words. So that obviously uh, plays an important role. So there's not only a strong correlation of the D-deletion with um, special pragmatic function words, but a particularly strong one with, <coughs> excuse me, vulgar words. All right, what about the second thing? Uh, so rep repetition of characters. So obviously if you, uh, you know, do computer media communication by typing into YouTube comments or something like that, you know, you can't really mark your utterances in the same way as you can in speaking using prosody, intonation and things like that. Uh, and so people use different mechanisms uh, and you all know those. So those again might be things like emoticons, uh, it might be uh, capitalization, uh, you know, that screaming effect that uh, all caps have. Um, and there might be character repetition. So something like this, uh, where LOL is lengthened to L-O-O-L, or, you know, also one or more Ls are added at the end or something uh, <clears throat> like that. Uh, it's an extremely frequent uh, phenomenon. Uh, it, it really happens a lot in, in the data that we collected. Um, and uh, an unlikely explanation that was actually suggested at one point, you know, was that uh, a reduplication, uh, like with the double O and L O O L, uh, it's not just an abbreviation of another expression, you know. So it's not that L O L means laughing out loud, and then L O O L means you know something like this, which someone came up with to obviously make it work, you know, but which will not work once you have the kind of excessive character repetitions that you can come up with, right? I mean, it's unlikely you can come up with a sequence. Uh, that would explain five O's between the two L's. Um, <clears throat> so that's definitely not it. So a more likely motivation would be something like an iconicity principle um, of quantity, where the idea would be, you know, that the amount of phonetic material or here lengthening reduplication of, of the characters somehow reflects the quality or the intensity or quantity or, or pluralization or something like that. And it explains character repetitions better because it's a cross-linguistically attested uh, cognitively motivated principle, and of course, it's um, it can be easily used to ex to handle even excessive character repetitions, um, which otherwise you know would be difficult to explain by coming up with a really long phrase that has you know multiple words with always between two L's. <laughs> but there is an additional complication, um, and that is if this principle was everything that was at work there, you know, then all characters should be repeated equally, either equally frequently on the whole, you know, out of the inventory of all characters or proportionately to their overall frequency, maybe in the standard language or in the internet corpus in general. Uh, but that's not the case if one looks at the numbers. Um, <clears throat> so there's gotta be something else that interacts with this in order to make it work. And so one hypothesis would be this. Um, the, the standard examples of iconicity principles like quantity, you know, they involve phonological features and character repetitions may take uh, over aspects of this, namely what prosody would do in verbal communication. So, you know, it's, I mean, not like this is uh, rocket science, you know, but the idea would be the lengthening of syllables in speaking might somehow be proportional to the repetitions of characters in typing. <clears throat> but that means the expectation or the hypothesis would be, you know, the degrees to which characters are repeated in typing is proportional to the degree to which the corresponding phonemes can be lengthened in speaking. And that's a little bit more interesting, you know, because obviously you can hold any key down, down for a second and, you know, get, I mean, you can hold down an M or a vowel, uh, you know, for, uh, a vowel character for five seconds, but you can also do that with a plosive. Um, but the plosive, you know, cannot easily be lengthened in speaking just like a vowel could. And so the expectation here would be that maybe that is something we would find as well. So we did actually three case studies uh, for this. Uh, so we looked at uh, different kinds of uh, ranges of words or lo uh, locations of uh, repetitions, 
namely uh, repetitions of characters at the beginnings of words, um, at the ends of words, and then also when the repetition basically is the whole word, right? So if you express doubt by typing, I don't know, like six M's, yeah, mm, like, mm, I don't know. Um, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm gonna only discuss uh, one of the three uh, repetitions at the beginnings of words, but let me tell you the results for the other two were pretty much exactly the same. Uh, so we looked for these kinds of word initial character repetitions um, with some regex that you can see there, doesn't really matter. Uh, we found approximately 20,000 word tokens made up of approximately 5,000 word types with different kinds of uh, initial character repetitions. And there was a strong frequency effect uh, such that, you know, um, there was a correlation between the length of the repetitions and their frequency. And if you look at the plot there, you know, we have the the log length of the repetition on the x-axis and the, the frequency of that repetition on the y-axis looks pretty Zipfian, right? So we do find the same kind of Zipfian distribution essentially that we find for all sorts of grammatical or lexical slots in language. We also find that for the repetitions here, uh, which in a sense is encouraging if anything. But we also do find a strong phonological effect. So the most often repeated characters represent vowels and glides, and the least often represented characters often are uh, consonants and often stops. So uh, again, interesting because you know any one of these characters could be uh, repeated a lot of times by holding a certain key on the keyboard down for quite some while, but people prefer to do it if the corresponding sound that is typically associated with it, you know, would also be one uh, that could in fact be lengthened in that way. Uh, and that's kind of interesting because, uh, you know, it, there's this, I mean, obviously, you know, it's, this is written data, people were typing, you know, on the other hand, we do find in the written data or in the frequency distributions of the written data, uh, residuals, uh, residual effects of uh, spoken language, which is interesting because, uh, you know, with some polemics, you know, a lot of times when people don't know what to say after a talk at a conference conference, then they say, well, but isn't it going to be all different in spoken data or in written data or something? And, you know, yes, a lot of times it's going to be uh, different, but in a lot of cases it might also not be. And there can be very interesting carryover effects from something typically pertaining to spoken data only even showing up in written data. All right, uh, again, the, the other two case studies, uh, whole words and ends of words came up with the same results. You can see that Zipfian plot there again. <clears throat> so, relatively strong evidence for some sort of effect like this. Um, the, the classes of words where those repetitions showed up were not particularly surprising, uh, we have to admit. Uh, so there were a bunch of discourse markers uh, like these uh, that involve greetings or simply, you know, co communicating some sort of emotional stance. Um, other kinds of expressions of emotions uh, like this. Uh, terms of address, uh, I plus verb phrases, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, positive adjectives, you know, with a positive sentiment or something like that. So a lot of different ways in which emotions or effective stances are communicated. Again, not particularly surprising that those would maybe be uh, a preferred locus of these kinds of repetition effects. All right, <clears throat> so uh, interim conclusions uh, for this part. Uh, you know, even phenomena at the intersection of the linguistic fringes in a way, you know, conscious spellomorphy, not exactly at the heart of what most morphologists are interested in, and things like repetitions, you know, they do reveal trends that may be of interest to people from an exemplar-based perspective. Uh, you know, we saw that deletion is subject to a variety of interacting factors such as frequency, phonology, semantics, pragmatics, and sociolinguistics. Um, and repetition is subject to this interaction between iconicity on the one hand and then articulatory factors or, you know, degree of length and ability if there is such a word. Um, <clears throat> so uh, quite interesting. And so obviously it's not language change proper, you know, but they do exhibit many motivated characteristics um, of both general and medium specific uh, language change, uh, you know, obviously in a test tube and obviously on steroids given how quickly things happen and change on the internet. But um, it is an area where a lot of linguistic innovation happens and might, you know, from there spill over into uh, everyday language. So it is an area that I think is, is really, you know, I mean, should be examined more uh, for the kinds of things we can learn from it. 
All right, so <clears throat> that was uh, case study one. So um, spellomorphy, so orthography, and you know, really, really simple statistics. Um, so let's change things up completely and uh, look at something else, uh, namely uh, turn taking. And this is work that uh, has been done with together with Christoph Gulemann uh, from the University of Freiburg in Germany, and that's uh, going to appear in the Journal of Phonetics. It's concerned with um, the high degree of precision timing in turn taking. Okay, um, if, uh, people, uh, if people talk to each other, two people talk to each other or more, uh, you know, there's often extremely small turn transition times, you know, in the range of 200 milliseconds or less. Uh, so less time than it might take you to blink. Uh, you know, the amount of coordination there is really extremely high. And this is something that has been robustly replicated uh, for many different languages. And obviously the degree of precision we find there, you know, raises the obvious question of, you know, how, how the hell is it possible that interlocutors arrive at that speed and that precision? Um, many cues that indicate turn finality have been proposed. So the idea being that, you know, maybe the speaker is doing something that allows the hearer to already anticipate, okay, I mean, it's gonna be my turn now, or um, it might be my turn now, there's gonna be an opportunity to take over. Uh, that will present itself uh, very soon. And those come from a variety of different domains. So there's uh, obviously non-linguistic cues. Uh, there's a variety of linguistic cues uh, and then paralinguistic cues, uh, you know, creaks, aspiration, pitch drop, uh, repeated there, okay, turn final lengthening, uh, all sorts of things like that. And so in this particular case study, we want to talk about the, uh, the last one of these, uh, <coughs> turn final lengthening. Doing research on this is really not that easy. Uh, and if you look at the kind of work that has been done there, you know, it, to, to a certain extent, at least, you know, they, they suffer from some, I mean, highly understandable, but still from some problems. Uh, and so one is that if you look at the data, uh, the data are often extremely specialized. Uh, they're often experimental, which means they might at least lack a little bit in terms of ecological validity. And often also they're really small in size. Uh, so just to give you some examples here, so there's a study in 72, which was basically using two 19-minute therapeutic interviews. Uh, so not much. Um, and Bugles and Torreira, a button press experiment using two different utterances. That's it, two different, uh, I mean, contrasting utterances. Uh, one being, you know, so you're a student, question mark. And the other one being, so you're a student at Radboud University, question mark. You know, making sure that at, in one of the two forms, you know, the word student is uh, at the end of the question. And in the other one, when the location is added, you know, then it's not. So, and the question would be, you know, is the, is the duration that people take to produce the word student, is that in any way correlated with whether the PP is still following or not? Right. And then local and Walker, you know, one 12 minute phone call. So also not that much. Um, why is this so hard? Well, um, here is an, an insightful quote from that same paper, which is long, you know, but still worth uh, reading out because it basically captures everything beautifully. Uh, providing robust, quantified, comparative measures of duration is problematic <clears throat> when working with naturally occurring materials, syllable and word structure, accentual patterning, position and utterance, speaker, overall speaking rate, information structure, ATC, are all things which cannot be controlled for and which moreover are known to impact on the durational characteristics of words and parts of words, right? So essentially saying, you know, there's so many covariates uh, that you can't control for them. Uh, and that's what makes it really hard and, you know, has been used as a motivation to do experiments of the type that you see here at the top of the slide. Now, there's also another methodological problem. And that is that, you know, if if you look at the kind of experimental approaches that I showed you on the previous slide, you know, so you're a student, so you're a student at Radboud University, uh, you compare the durations of one word, student, in two conditions, you know, question final, yes versus no. Uh, okay, but if you apply that to observational data, you know, you are extremely quickly limited to only high frequency words. Uh, and that is because, you know, you will only be able to work with words that are frequently enough that at one point uh, or at several points, ideally, you know, they show up at the end of utterances, but they're also frequently enough not at the end of utterances. That's not gonna happen with words that are relatively rare um, or it's extremely unlikely to happen. And so, you know, using that kind of paradigm uh, quickly makes it very difficult to come up with reasonable numbers of data points uh, for analysis. 
Also, uh, how will speakers realize that a lengthening that they, <coughs> um, that they, I mean, how will hearers realize a lengthening, you know, is a turn final lengthening or a turn yielding one? I mean, if they perceive a lengthening at all, what do they contrast that with? Okay, it's, that's not obvious. <coughs> One approach might be uh, what one might want to call, you know, the lexicon hypothesis, where uh, you assume that listeners or, and or speakers, you know, have stored canonical durations for words. And from an exemplar-based perspective, you know, that might sound like an attractive option because exemplar-based uh, linguists assume that, you know, we store uh, an, an amazing amount of uh, very detailed uh, linguistic and contextual information in a multidimensional space. Uh, on the other hand, you know, it's it's also the case that listeners can adjust extremely quickly to speaker-specific speech characteristics. Okay, we know that from dialect research. We know that from, uh, you know, native speakers adjusting to the idiosyncrasies of non-native speakers, uh, whose timing, uh, and and vowel frequencies and other kinds of things like that might be off. Uh, that can be done so quickly that you know maybe that's not what's go what's going on. Of course, one might say that, you know, okay, maybe what the native speaker does is, you know, they multiply everything in their stored canonical duration by, you know, 1.2 to get to this, what this native speaker is doing. But it doesn't really sound that likely. Um, it sounds like a, uh, a little contrived. Uh, an alternative would be uh, what one might want to call a speech rate hypothesis, where the idea is that the listeners monitor the current input for speed changes. And then speakers might decrease the speed of speaking over the course of the turn to you know, signal in advance to the listener that you know, <clears throat> here's, here's gonna be an opportunity uh, for you to take over. And any such process, of course, any analysis of any such process also would need to control for all sorts of other characteristics that you saw on the previous slide, you know, all the kinds of covariants that were mentioned. <clears throat> so what do we do? Um, we extracted uh, from the British, British National Corpus uh, a random sample of 810 word turns. <clears throat> 10 word turns because in the data that we looked at, that was the average turn length. <clears throat> and then we looked at the following variables. Uh, so in uh, one analysis, uh, the duration of the word in milliseconds, uh, you know, from Prague was a dependent variable. Um, the central predictor for what we were interested in here, uh, this idea of turn final lengthening was, you know, the position of the word in the turn. And so since those were all 10 word turns, you know, that's just a number from one to 10. And then there was a bunch of control variables. Uh, one uh, being the position of the nucleus. So where is the most prominently stressed word in the turn, uh, you know, that carries the most important um, piece of information in that turn? Uh, what is the frequency of the word type? Um, because, you know, more frequent words are typically uh, spoken faster. Um, and those frequencies we got from the spoken BNC. The uh, phonemic length of the word type. I mean, do I even have to mention why one would want to control for this? I guess not. Um, and then we included the surprisal of a word. Uh, so how informative is the word in the current position? Uh, in the turn, and I will show you how we computed that in a moment. And then we had another control variable. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, which it's called, uh, we called it, you know, difference from mean previous. So um, in a way that I will show you in a moment, you know, it captures the change in mean word duration uh, at, at a particular position in the turn relative to all other previous words in the turn. Okay, I'll, again, I'll exemplify this in a moment. And then, of course, there were random effects. Um, so speakers uh, were nested into files, and then uh, there were words, obviously. And then uh, we also had a part of speech uh, a word class <coughs> annotation for everything. <coughs> um, let me skip over the nuclear slide, which you know basically just so show, shows how we use pitch here. So for surprise, though, what we did is this: um, for every turn initial word, we used this formula, which you know just means uh, we took the negative log of the relative frequency of a word, right? So if it's turn initial, then there was no immediately preceding word in the turn. So we just took, we just computed, okay, how frequent is that word in general, you know, as a proportion out of the corpus and then negative binary log of that. However, for any word later in the turn, uh, we looked at, okay, how surprising is this word given that this other one was right before it? 
Okay, so we basically took a conditional or transitional probability um, and took the negative binary log of those. And, you know, just to show you that this is not insane, you know, here's results from a sanity check that show that this does capture something. Uh, so here are some biograms with low surprisals. So things that are strongly, uh, I mean, that are not surprising at all. You expect the second thing given you've heard the first. And so we have things that are due to the annotation of the data in the British National Corpus. You know, so this is gonna, I'm gonna, whatever, ain't, wanna, and stuff like that. So those are separated to basically say, okay, this is the going and this is the to, so to speak. Uh, then we have expressions like, you know, supposed to, corned beef, thank you, right? And then things like willing to, kind of, couple of, stuff like that. So in, in any one of these cases, you know, the, the second word is not really that surprising if you know the word before it. Uh, here's the opposite, uh, biograms with high surprisal. So these are cases where, you know, knowing the first word doesn't really make you guess the second word. Right. If I if I ask, you know, what word might come after your, I mean, yeah, you might say bathroom, but you know, it's probably not that likely that you will, and you're even less likely to say keep. You know, I mean, this might be uh, from you know earn your keep or something, but it doesn't really happen a lot. Whereas if I ask you, you know, what kind of word is going to come after kind or thank, chances that you would say of or you are pretty high. Okay, so this is the kind of information uh, that basically surprisal tries to capture. Okay. Uh, now the difference from mean previous uh, is this. So like I said, it's how much iteration value differs from the mean of all prior words in the turn. So uh, I'm hoping you can see the mouse, you know, but so positioned in turn one, if a word there has a duration of one, you know, one whatever unit, doesn't matter. Uh, there's, no, there's no previous one. So that actually scores a value of zero at the beginning. If the next word has a duration of two, okay, then uh, from that we subtracted the mean of all previous words. There's only one previous word which had a duration of one, and so that difference becomes one. If the third word has a duration of three, as you hopefully can see me circling here, uh, you know, then from three we subtract the mean of one and two, which is 1.5, so 1.5 remains. Okay, so the difference from previous mean basically is a way of um, capturing turn internal uh, variability as you move from one word to the next relative to all previous words that have already been produced in your turn. Okay, so, so duration basically captures information vertically basically across turns, right, because every word is looked at in isolation and that's it. Difference from mean previous captures information also horizontally by which I mean, you know, within the turns, and it therefore controls for uh, turn internal information. So we did uh, two kinds of analyses, one on duration, uh, one on difference from mean previous. I'm probably going to skip the second one because the results basically confirmed the one of the first, and, you know, I want to make sure we have enough time for the last part. So modeling duration. <laughs> Um, we did a backwards model selection process. Uh, our starting regression model kind of looked like this. Okay, so duration was modeled as a function of our main predictor of interest, you know, pause and turn. Then all these other controls, frac length, surprisal, nucleus. And then since we were interested in, you know, pause and turn, we wanted to make sure that anything else that might interfere with it or interact with it is covered. We also included these two uh, variables in there as well. Uh, that model was only used to delete outliers as is customary in this kind of research. Uh, so residuals that were too big, you know, uh, were discarded, those data points, uh, which only affected, you know, 1.15% of the data. Uh, and uh, of course we had an elaborated random effect structure, which even more of course did not converge. So that had to be reduced in a variety of ways. Um, so the, the usual kind of stuff. And I'm skipping over how many of these predictors were prepared. So many of these were logged or, and standardized and stuff like that. Those things are not relevant at this point. If you have questions about that, you know, I'm happy to answer them later. So reduction of the uh, fixed and random effect structures led to a final model in which we had curved effects of controls. Uh, so of length of surprise and frequency. Uh, we also had a significant curved effect of the control variable difference from mean previous. 
And then there was a significant interaction of a curved effect of pos in turn, a polynomial, uh, together with nucleus. Okay, and there were none of the usual red flags. You know, there was no collinearity issues. There was no heteroscedasticity. Uh, R squared was pretty great um, given the heterogeneity of the data. So we were pretty happy with that. Um, and, you know, just for the sake of pointing this out, you know, um, the fact that all these things are curved, I think is, is an important message. You know, um, I mean, I see and review a lot of papers where people do stuff like this, you know, but a lot of times all these predictors, I mean, the numeric ones are only allowed uh, to basically co-vary with something as a straight line. Uh, when in fact, a lot of uh, phenomena, uh, in particular cognitive ones, but also articulatory ones, you know, there's no real great reason other than maybe at the beginning Occam's razor to assume that, you know, a straight line relation is really the one that is needed. Um, and so looking at curvature here, you know, was rewarding because in fact it turned out that for every single predictor uh, it was needed in fact so going with the normal approach of just fitting a straight line you know here was never good enough in fact but so what's the nature of the effects uh, in particular you know of course the one uh, that involves parse and turn because that's the one we were interested in most and so the slide here has two different uh, ways of visualizing these uh, data um, it's a little tricky. Uh, so uh, let's start with the left one and see how that works. So um, here uh, we have a plot where the 10 positions in the turn are on the x-axis, right? So there's 10 word turns, so there's 10 slots like that. Um, and then uh, the y-axis is the position of the nucleus in the turn. Okay, so uh, so this eight here, again, I'm hoping you can see that. So that means uh, that eight is a prediction for how long a word will be when the word is in the fourth slot um, and the nucleus of that turn is in the first position. Okay, and, uh, you know, let me pick another one here at the top. You know, this number one here at the top, uh, you know, that's a prediction for how long the word's duration is going to be when, again, the word is in the fourth slot, but now the nucleus is in the 10th position, so way behind it. Okay, this is how you read that. And then the numbers and their sizes indicate, you know, length, I mean, predicted length of duration. So big nines and big eights, you know, mean, oh, that word is going to be long. And, you know, small ones and twos, like up here, mean, oh, wow, this word is going to be short. Okay. And this effect is shown here as an, you know, like based on an effects kind of representation, meaning all the other predictors are controlled for. Okay, so those do not figure in there. This is, this is um, predicted values, not observed averages over something. And so what you can see is that if the nucleus is at the beginning in position one or two, right? So the bottom two rows of the left panel, then as you go from left to right, you know, the numbers go down. So when the nucleus is at the beginning, you know, people on the whole are predicted to become faster towards the end or, you know, hardly ever change towards the end here. Um, in uh, most other cases, we can see that, you know, there is an increase towards length at the end. Uh, but if the nucleus is pretty much at the back, uh, you know, like here at the beginning of the, at the top of the graph, you know, then if the lengths first go down, the durations go down, and then they go up again. And that is what maybe, you know, it depends, people react differently to plots, uh, what you can see on the right side here. Okay, so this is the same thing, position and turn. And then every line here, the lines with the ones, the lines with the twos, and so on, is one of the positions of the nuclei. And so you can see that when the nucleus is in first position, the predicted durations go way down. When it's in the second position, it kind of stays straight. But in all others, you know, it goes up. And, and sometimes, you know, only after having gone down first, but then going up at the end. Okay, this is one way in which you see that, you know, fitting this without curvature, you're, you're not going to be happy. Okay, <clears throat> so... Um, we do find a turn final lengthening effect, but depending on where the nucleus is, you know, we don't find it everywhere and we find it only after there was a sort of a down tick in the middle and then an uptick at the end. Uh, and again, the uh, results for the other regression, which I'm gonna skip here uh, in the interest of time uh, was uh, kind of the same. 
the results for the controls uh, all made uh, a whole lot of sense. Um, just very briefly, you know, this is the frequency effect. So if words become more frequent, you get faster, but only to a point. If words get longer, you know, well, then you need longer to pronounce them. Uh, surprisal has, a, uh, has the expected effect, although here at the end, there's a little downtick. I can talk about why I don't think that matters. And different from premiums means, you know, that's capturing what happens in the turn. So the correlation is really strong. It makes sure that our pos and turn effect, uh, you know, doesn't anti-conservatively anti gobble up the variability of this effect. All right, wrapping up uh, this one. So we found that even when you look at messy observational data, uh, when you do control for many confounds and idiosyncrasies, which count, uh, counter to local and Wagner is actually possible, at least you know, to a certain extent, uh, then we do find the expected duration and pos and turn correlation which is mediated by that nucleus uh, interaction. And they are clearly compatible with the speech rate hypothesis. So speakers do seem to slow down over the course of a turn here, but it depends on the position of a nucleus uh, because if the nucleus is at the beginning, it's actually, there's actually a linear decrease in speed. Um, uh, sorry, an increase in speed typo here. And uh, the, <clears throat> the slowing down thing can be a curvilinear effect, namely after a speeding up in the middle of the turn. <clears throat> Obviously, this is not the only factor. So future work, you know, there's a multiple points of attack that future work uh, could focus on, you know, more diverse turn lengths. Uh, what about uh, turns that have more than one nucleus as indicated by the pitch? Um, what about in other information from the conversational structure? And in particular, what about cases where the turn uh, turn transition didn't work really well, so where there was overlap. And then we had some thoughts on how better to measure surprisal, even though, you know, not really that, that part at least is not that pressing because the surprisal effect is pretty good. All right, <clears throat> so last one. Um, so last one, like I said, a little bit more applied and uh, statistically we will have one example with extremely simple things, uh, essentially just percentages. And then one example that's maybe a little bit more uh, advanced. And so for the next example, there's, uh, you need to have a little cultural background for people who are not from the US and follow uh, you know, legal <laughs> judgments here. Uh, so I wanna start by talking about uh, the notion of sentence enhancements. And this is work with uh, Brian Slocum, um, uh, one paper at least published in the BYU Law Review. And so what sentence enhancements refers to is this. Uh, so the sentence uh, that someone who has been found guilty of a crime, the sentence that they receive from a judge, uh, they can involve a baseline. And that baseline would be defined by the statute that was violated, right? So if you, uh, whatever, committed a burglary or something, and then the, the law might say, well, punishable by, you know, minimally whatever incarceration for this many years. But there can also be a sentence enhancement that increases the punishment. Okay, and uh, those might be due to uh, various reasons. Um, many of them are probably relatively obvious. Uh, so for instance, in a crime that involves physical violence, if that violence led to a serious injury on the part of the victim, you know, then a sentence enhancement might kick in and might increase the time you get jailed, for instance. Okay, or obviously, you know, if you commit a crime while you're already on probation, well, that doesn't, go, that's not going to help. So you might get a sentence enhancement for that. If, uh, you know, if you're the defendant and you have a history of as an offender, you know, that might lead uh, to a sentence enhancement. If the crime can be characterized as a hate crime, <clears throat> and, and this is going to be the focus of this little case study here, when the crime involves using a firearm. Okay, so gun. And you know this is uh, this is really important in a sense because these enhancements can be lead to extremely harsh judgments um, <clears throat> in the U.S. So if you use a gun in relation to or during and in relation to a drug trafficking crime, as it will be in a moment, you know, then you might get a sentence. Then the sentence requirement might be you know minimally five years of jail. If that gun is a machine gun or involves a silencer, uh, you know, there's a minimally thirty years incarceration. So, you know, these kinds of things can quickly add up, you know, um, and so it's an important, I mean, dealing with sentence enhancement and the statutes that prescribe them, you know, that's, a, that's an 
integral part of arriving at the judgment for a certain uh, sentence. Now, what does it mean though to use a firearm? Okay, uh, and so in a, in a better interactive setting, you know, in a room, I would now, you know, ask the audience uh, to collect some opinions. Uh, obviously, this is a little more difficult here. So the question, you know, just think about it for a second, you know, what does it mean to use a firearm or what does it mean to use a firearm during and in relation to a drug crime? Okay, just, you know, think about it. Now, if you do that, if you ask people often enough, uh, you know, then you will quickly find that they converge pretty quickly on one or two things. Um, <clears throat> namely, the ordinary meaning of, you know, use a firearm is, well, use it as a weapon, right? So that means uh, you might shoot it, right? Or you might brandish it as a threat to make someone do something uh, <clears throat> they wouldn't otherwise do. Right, so I would use a gun if I shoot it, or I would use a gun if I put it next, uh, if I put it against your head and say, you know, open that bank safe. You know, that would be using a firearm. And you know, just while we're at it, you know, you might also want to think about what do you think um, carry a firearm means. Uh, again, in a more interactive setting, one will very quickly find that people say something like, well, obviously, you know, if you have it in your pocket, maybe if you have it in a holster. Um, maybe if you carry it in a backpack on your back or something like that. Um, if we have time to discuss this, or if you have questions about it, you know, we can get back to this uh, later because it's an interesting question as well. Now, the slide refers to ordinary meaning here in the middle, right? We would probably say the ordinary meaning of use a firearm <coughs> is to use a firearm as a weapon. Uh, ordinary meaning is actually kind of a technical term in jurisprudence. Um, and the idea is that laws are written so as to regulate behavior uh, in a way to be understood by ordinary people. Um, okay, so the idea is, you know, you can read the law that govern, you know, your country or your district or whatever, and you know what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. You can rely on that, that will be consistently applied. And also crucially, you know, the idea is if you think that that's how laws are interpreted, you know, then the idea is that that respects the will of the legislative body, right? Because legislators or parliaments or Congress, they write, write laws in a certain way because they have certain intentions. Uh, and the idea is that, you know, hopefully ordinary people recover those intentions and can plan their actions uh, accordingly. And in fact, in the US, the Supreme Court, SCOTUS, uh, has argued that uh, quote, you know, words not defined in statute should be given ordinary or common meaning, unquote. Okay, so if something's not a technical term that is defined in the relevant law, for instance, uh, then it should be given its ordinary or common meaning. And the reason for that is, is really obvious in a sense, because there's no other source of the reasonable inference about what Congress understood when writing or what its words will bring to the mind of a careful reader, right? So the idea is, um, if you read something, then you um, attribute to what you read in the law, you know, the ordinary meaning, because that's probably what the leg legislators meant when they wrote that law, so as to prescribe a certain kinds of behavior. But something like ordinary meaning or plain meaning or common meaning, it refers to the sense of a word or a phrase, most likely in a given context, but the sense is not obvious at all. And what you see, if you look at this kind of stuff, um, when judges uh, speak of ordinary meaning, they often seem to be speaking to a question of relative frequency of something, of a sense of a word, uh, as in a point on a following spectrum, uh, ranging from possible by a common, by a most frequent to maybe the prototype, of course that could be most frequent, but doesn't have to be, uh, to exclusive. Right? And so there's a famous uh, legal hypothetical called no vehicles in the park, where the question is, you know, what does that actually prohibit? I guess we all agree it would prohibit a car, you know, or a, uh, a semi truck, uh, you know, but what about a wheelchair? What about a Segway? Are those vehicles, if they are vehicles, are they meant by that statute? You know, that's what this hypothetical is about. And so, you know, a possible sense of vehicle is a pet, you know, as a vehicle of contagion of a certain disease. A probably common vehicle would be a bicycle. Uh, and probably the most frequent and prototype use of vehicle would be a car, you know, with four wheels and an engine. Now, the point is that justices, uh, even on the Supreme Court, you know, have argued that meanings 
from different points on this continuum are the ordinary meaning. But they did so without noticing that that's what they're doing. And they take different, different positions on the continuum in, in the same case. So within one and the same opinion for one and the same law case, uh, justices might say, well, the, the ordinary meaning of this word is this, and it's a possible one. And then on the next page, they talk about the ordinary meaning of that same word, and they refer to the prototype, okay? Which obviously is not helping when it comes to understanding law and understanding, you know, how you can plan uh, what you're going to do. How do they get there? Uh, well, they use dictionaries and they use etymologies, uh, but a lot of times, you know, they cherry pick dictionaries, uh, they cherry pick dictionary definitions. Uh, they trust them and they trust classifications like obsolete or especially even if, you know, it's not obvious that those are always correct. Uh, they, re they rely on the order of senses provided in a dictionary uh, and in one particularly infamous case, even when the order of senses in the dictionary was declared to be meaningless in the front matter of that very same dictionary. And they forget or ignore the dictionaries usually are contextless and that if context is provided, then that might be not because that is an ordinary context, but precisely because it is very special. <coughs> All right, let me skip this uh, in the interest of time. So let's look at one uh, brief example here, uh, namely a famous case, uh, Smith versus US 1993. Um, in this case, uh, the defendant was convicted for using a firearm during and in relation to a drug trafficking crime <coughs> across, uh, according to criminal code. And the question was, you know, what kind of uh, sentence enhancement would apply? Uh, the question now is what did Smith, <coughs> the person who was convicted, what did he do uh, when he used the firearm? He actually exchanged that firearm, a MAC-10, and a silencer for drugs. So he, was not, he wasn't shooting it, he wasn't brandishing it, he was using it like you would be using a dollar bills or anything else you just trade. Okay, so he used it for butter, essentially. Now, uh, that case uh, arrived <laughs> on appeal at the Supreme Court and uh, they said he used a gun. So the sentence enhancement applies. How did they support that verdict? They said, the majority said, you know, um, the meaning of use is to employ or to convert to one service. And so exchanging a firearm for drugs can be described as use within the everyday meaning of the term. Okay, but here's the thing, can, okay, my emphasis, but that's what they wrote. Okay, um, so that compared to what we saw before, you know, that's like, it's a possible sense, but do we really think it's a prototypical sense or the ordinary meaning? You know, like ordinarily use, use something means trade it. I, you know, I dare say that probably not many in the audience, you know, earlier when I asked the question, what does it mean to use a firearm came up with, you know, oh, obviously trading it for something. And whoops, and they said uh, also, uh, one can use a firearm in a number of ways. Okay, the, uh, that one example of use is the first to come to mind does not preclude us from recognizing that there are other uses that qualify as well. Okay, and so again, in the interest of time, maybe, I mean, look at what they're doing here. They're, they're saying, you know, one should be using the ordinary meaning, but then this part, um, you know, if using exchanging a firearm for drugs can be described, that's using the possible sense on the previous slides, you know, continuum, right? That doesn't mean it's the ordinary sense. And then the last thing here on the slide, they say that one example of use is the first one that comes to mind. I mean, that's for linguists, you know, that's the best operationalization of ordinariness or prototypicality, you know, we can come up with at, at many points. Uh, that's the one that they actually reject in the same opinion in which they said a few pages before that is actually what one should be using. Now, the minority argued vehemently against that, but, you know, from the fact that I say it's the minority, you already know what the result is. Uh, so Justice Scalia in particular dissented with the majority by arguing that the court failed to consider context and ordinary meaning. Uh, to use an instrumentality, he said, 
like a firearm, you know, ordinarily means to use it for its intended purpose. Uh, to speak of using a firearm is to speak of using it for its distinctive purpose, i.e. as a weapon. And uh, well, uh, Justice Scalia had a very um, sometimes entertaining way of writing. Uh, he said, or wrote, you know, when someone asks, do you use a cane? He's not inquiring whether you have your grandfather's silver handled walking stick on display in the hall. He wants to know whether you walk with it. Right. So basically, he was making the point that the majority used dictionaries and declared a possible sense, uh, the ordinary one. <clears throat> uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip one slide. So what did we do? Um, we use an R script to search uh, a section of the corp uh, Corpus of Contemporary American English uh, for the lemma use, where it was tagged as a verb and followed by a determiner or possessive pronoun, maybe followed by an adjective and then followed by a noun, um, which, as you might imagine, returned a ton of examples, but only 159 or something like that, where the subsequent context contained a small set of weapon nouns. Okay, so gun and derivatives, so like uh, handgun, shotgun, stuff like that, you know, and then these other weapon nouns there. And then we checked how many of these valid cases involved a use for barter. Okay, so how often when there was use uh, and then any one of these things, did it mean barter? And it didn't ever. Okay, in 88% of the cases, clearly in 12%, very, very likely not. I mean, you really had to bend over backwards to see like, okay, obviously this could be barter or not. And then we checked an additional 159 cases of use plus any concrete direct object to see, okay, maybe the, the trade or barter meaning comes from, you know, not use plus gun, but use plus anything concrete. Uh, again, from that random selection, not a single item uh, had that meaning, uh, not one. So these data are clearly incompatible with the court's view that the ordinary meaning of use a firearm is, you know, to trade it in. Uh, it shows that ordinarily, it doesn't mean that, okay? So we're not disputing that it can mean that. The question is whether it ordinarily means that and whether Smith could have read the law and known that that was prohibited. And so in this case, uh, Scalia's dissent, and actually in a later case, uh, court in uh, Watson versus US, you know, that kind of logic is uh, clearly supported. <clears throat> and that's what I just said before. So corpus linguistics has a huge potential for these kinds of application in legal contexts because there's a lot of uh, case law and a lot of you know, prior opinions and precedents where everything hinges on the interpretation of a particular item. <laughs> um, but you know, with all due respect to judges and lawyers and legal scholars and whatever, that does not mean that all these professionals are equally equipped to undertake such analyses well enough. Uh, if you point out the kinds of things that I have shown you here, uh, you will regularly hear, you know, well, but we read and write all day, so we know language. Well, but reading and writing a lot of formal and legal stuff, also known as, you know, the most unordinary registers ever, you know, that does not automatically enable a legal scholar to determine ordinary meaning. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, it takes a few years to get a linguistics PhD if you do, for instance, uh, if you look at meanings and stuff like that. I mean, there's a lot of technical stuff a lot of theory and things like that that you need to learn. Okay. <clears throat> and so the, the plea here is a bit, you know, like just as legal practitioners or lawmakers defer to expert witnesses when it comes to fingerprinting, uh, genetic information or other kinds of forensic applications, they may have to do the same sometimes when it comes to analyze and not just intuit on things that are as complex and multidimensional as meaning. Okay, let me ask uh, the organizers here, maybe. So I'm, I'm already a little bit over an hour. Do you want me to stop here so that I can take questions or would you want me to go over uh, the last case study, which was relatively quick, but still I want to give you guys the option. What's the preference? We still have time, Professor, if you wanna go ahead the other case study, it's fine. Okay, okay, just checking, then I'll do that, no problem. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, so the last case study, um, again, also applied and uh, from a, a legal expert witness case, like I said. Uh, so it's a case involving authorship attribution and in an internet trolling uh, lawsuit. 
Um, and so obviously this is more low key than, you know, what the Supreme Court does, uh, you know, but at the same time, it still affects, you know, people's lives very concretely and uh, sometimes actually is also really interesting. Uh, because this is an actual case, you know, I've anonymized and changed things a little bit, you know, but the gist of what I'm going to be talking about here is the same as in the actual case, so the details of which I can't reveal. So uh, <laughs> this is the backstory. Uh, so an attorney that represented a certain kind of business, um, actually a restaurant, that I can say, you know, um, that was sued by a customer for being treated uh, badly or discriminatorily. So the customer uh, sued the restaurant because he or she claimed the treatment he or she received was motivated by him or her, you know, being a member of a protected minority, plus actually some other ugly follow-up stuff. And so the attorney uh, trying to help the restaurant uh, had a strategy that involved uh, two kinds of things. Uh, one was basically, you know, he said, she said kind of defense. Uh, so there was no real evidence for what the customer claimed happened. And so the, the attorney was going down the route of, well, the customer says this, the, uh, the proprietor of the restaurant says that, and so we don't have any evidence. So, you know, <clears throat> if in doubt, you know, in, in favor of the defense. But then the other argument was this, uh, namely trying to demonstrate that the customer had a history of launching gratuitous lawsuits against people and other businesses and then smearing these people and businesses online under different fake accounts. <clears throat> and the idea was, you know, to create, or the hypothesized idea, you know, is that the customer would do so to create a history of outrage, outrage about that business, delivering bad service or being discriminatory and so on. So that hopefully, you know, that business would be so scared that they just, you know, quickly settle out of court. So the customer receives a payout and, and you know, in return shuts up and drops this lawsuit. Okay, and so that's what the attorney wanted uh, to demonstrate. <clears throat> now, it's essentially a corpus linguistic task uh, because you know what you need to see is whether certain negative reviews of the business on different websites and under different names, you know, were in fact all written by the plaintiff, so by the customer. What do you need for this? Well, you obviously you need the texts to be attributed, so those are the negative reviews on different websites under different names. You know, those are the texts uh, for, for which we need to find out who wrote them or who wrote them most likely. And then we need training material, you know, for some sort of statistical model, uh, which means we need texts that were known to be written by other authors. So other, let's say, negative reviews of that business or other businesses from that same domain, um, but written by not the plaintiff. And then finally, we need texts that we know the plaintiff, the customer wrote. Okay, so that would be, uh, so the training material would be to make a statistical model learn, oh, okay, so the plaintiff writes this way and other people write that way. And so now, now that I know this, I can look at the texts to be attributed and figure out, you know, whether it's more likely that the plaintiff, the customer wrote them or someone else. But then, of course, if you're talking about a statistical model learning this type of stuff, you know, you also need features. What are the features that the statistical model is supposed to pick up on um, uh, in order to figure out, you know, was this the plaintiff, yes or no? And uh, to just give you an example for stuff like this in a literary context, you know, um, there might be a newly discovered literary work, you know, so suddenly we find a manuscript that no one else knew anything about. And then we think, oh, this could have been whatever. Shakespeare or something, right? The usual example. Um, and so that means our training material would need to include, you know, stuff written by Shakespeare that we know he has written and stuff written by other people, you know, from the same time and the same genre, blah, 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 relatively well comparable so that we can train a model on, you know, this is how Shakespeare writes. This is how other people write. Now tell me who wrote text Q, you know, was that Shakespeare too? Was that somewhere else? Now, what are, what are those features? Um, again, in the interest of time, maybe let me just show it, you know, like this, it can be a ton of different things. Many, I mean, dozens and dozens of them have been developed and used successfully or not, you know, in a variety of applications. Uh, lexical features having to do with frequencies of words and engrams and lexical diversity, features below the level of the word on the level of, you know, orthography, characters, punctuation, morphological features, sentence features, combinations of all these things. So, I mean, there's a ton of things to choose from. 
So what did I use here? Um, so the texts to be attributed uh, were extremely negative postings on multiple websites uh, for reviews or even other websites whose whole purpose is just to slander people. Uh, so that made for some very ugly reading. Uh, the training material uh, was interesting. So the texts known to be written by other authors. So what I did there is I pseudo randomly selected similar postings uh, from the same and similar websites on which you know, supposedly the plaintiff posted and on similar kinds of businesses and of course with a similar sentiment. <laughs> the texts known to be written by the suspected author. So the texts that we knew the customer had written, those were interesting uh, because, uh, and again, I can't give details here, but that was correspondence between the suspected author, the customer, and uh, for lack of a better term, a confidant. Um, <clears throat> and those were emails, um, which would normally not have been, I mean, would have normally <clears throat> enjoyed privacy protection, but they were subpoenaed by the court. And so I was given um, <clears throat> approximately 50 or 60 PDF pages of personal emails written by that customer to someone else. Okay, so that was the training material. And then the features used were, you know, frequencies of punctuation marks in this case and idiosyncrasies of punctuation mark use. Um, <clears throat> I mean, those are the ones I used. So what did I do um, for the text to be attributed? So the highly negative, potentially, uh, you know, slanderous, libelous, whatever reviews. Uh, <clears throat> so each of those PDFs, you know, was loaded into R, OCR, into text files. Um, <clears throat> the uh, similar reviews, you know, from similar websites and stuff like that were downloaded for the same relevant geographical area. So those were essentially web scraped. And then the text known to be written by the customer, uh, you know, the subpoena ones, uh, those PDFs um, uh, were also loaded into our OCR into text files. Um, and then uh, that R script also determined for each of the text files. So both I mean, for all of the text files, right? The known cases, the unknown cases, and the training material. Um, the relative frequency of each of these features. And then a random forest, uh, so a predictive modeling approach, was trained on the training material to hopefully be able to distinguish the plaintiff, the suspected author, you know, from all others. And the results were pretty awesome. Um, so the accuracy, precision, and recall were really, really high. So the random forest was very clearly able to see uh, differences uh, between, you know, things we knew the customer wrote and things we knew the customer didn't write. Um, so that, you know, the, the forest found those things well. And then the forest was applied to the texts to be attributed. So to the highly negative uh, slanderous reviews on uh, multiple websites. And the result was pretty clear. Uh, for data processing reasons, uh, the, the those texts, you know, were analyzed line by line, um, and all 205 lines were attributed to the suspected author, i.e., to the customer. So the random forest said the customer wrote all this, um, and and not a single case was the predicted probability, you know, the certainty with which the random forest made that prediction below 0.8. Uh, so relatively clear. So in other words, the punctuation patterning in the postings in question is vastly more similar to the writing of the plaintiff to the customer. Uh, than to other people. And so it seems at least likely that the plaintiff is also the author of the extremely negative postings that, you know, under different names, different accounts or whatever, uh, try to create a negative story uh, about that uh, restaurant online. Okay, so uh, corpus linguistic methods, you know, different uh, kinds of applications, uh, in this case, uh, a legal one, but still, and a very small one, but still uh, somewhat important. And so again, you know, the main point of the talk as a whole coming to an end here is, you know, it's <clears throat> a lot of people, you know, when you ask them about corpus linguistics and they haven't done anything yet, you know, they, they basically think of, you know, lexes and maybe, you know, dictionaries or something like that. But the actual range of applications is vast um, <clears throat> from highly theoretical to very applied from very little statistical to highly statistical. Uh, it's a very diverse field. And, you know, I basically would just encourage everyone to try to get to know about it uh, a little bit more. Thanks.
Thank you, Professor, for your brilliant talk. Um, we have a couple of questions. So we have a couple of questions here. Let me start with one from Andrea. She didn't identify her institution, but she says, frequency, surprisal, and length are all dependent on each other. How did you deal with that in the model? And why control for all of them? Um, well, so they are, so frequency and length in general, you know, are certainly correlated. Um, I'm not necessarily sure they would be correlated with surprisal because surprisal as we computed it, you know, the, the surprisal value for nine of the 10 words, you know, didn't just depend on the frequency of the word, but it depended on the frequency of the word given the previous word. Uh, so it was a conditional probability and not just a regular, you know, raw probability. So I don't think um, that necessarily the, the high relation, uh, that there was necessarily going to be a high relationship between surprisal on the one hand and, you know, length and frequency on the other. Now, with regard to length and frequency, so yes, you know, in general, you know, obviously there is a really strong uh, correlation between the two. Um, however, I am, um, so first, you know, in general, I have seen cases where that relationship actually did not, uh, was not strong enough uh, in order to raise collinearity problems. Uh, in fact, the correlation wasn't high at all for certain data sets. Uh, in this particular case, you know, the way we treated the data apparently um, did not cause any problems. So because, you know, like I said, we did check for collinearity during the whole uh, model selection process. Um, and it, uh, there were no red flags of that type. So we looked at uh, specifically variance inflation factors and things like that. Um, and in part, you know, this might be due to the fact that, uh, well, first, you know, um, they were transformed. Uh, so in both cases, um, so they were uh, standardized. Uh, frequency was square root transformed and uh, length was logged. So part of the correlation might have been destroyed a little bit by that. Uh, second, because we used orthogonal polynomials, um, at least, you know, those components are also less likely to be highly correlated because of, you know, if you create orthogonal polynomials to the second degree for a numeric predictor like this, you end up with two completely uncorrelated columns in the model matrix. And so that in turn decreases the potential amount of collinearity in the data. So, I mean, sorry, like a super technical answer in a sense, you know, but that's, that's kind of how we approach this. Okay. Uh, okay, our next, the next question is from Talita Aureliano. She's, she asks, is it possible to compare variables from two different experiments? For example, one with oral language and one with sign language? Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, okay, the, the, the best answer always is, you know, it depends, um, but it does depend. Uh, so it's hard to say. I mean, it depends in, uh, on several things. Uh, one, the, the most crucial of which might be something like, you know, okay, what is the nature of the variables that you are comparing across the two? Okay, so for a moment now, I will assume that it's not something, you know, that has to do with, you know, spoken versus signed language, uh, you know, not something that emerges directly from that, uh, but, but that you have in mind, you know, some other predictor that might feature in a model that involves spoken data and another model that involves signed data. So in that case, um, it may be possible to compare them. It, uh, then it begins to depend on the nature of the data, I mean, on the kinds of results that you have, okay? So one possibility uh, could be, you know, determining, uh, you know, if you have your model, if you determine confidence intervals of the effects uh, that you see for the same predictor in one model versus the other, you know, you can see, okay, how, how similar are they to each other? Do they overlap? Do they not overlap? I mean, what's, um, if they do not overlap well, but are they still, you know, for all practical intents and purposes, uh, really comparable, yes or no? Uh, so that might be one way to approach this. Um, another way to approach this might be, and that again, depends on your data, you know, can you, um, is it actually possible to put all the data from both the spoken and the signed data together into one model add a predictor that says which data set they're from, spoken versus signed, and then check for interactions of these predictors. Uh, that's another possibility. So again, relatively, you know, technical answer, you know, but 
I mean, those would be the first things that come to my mind approaching that kind of question. Okay. Uh, Luan Amaral says that in his talk, Hilbert showed that the word screwdriver, screwdriver most frequently occurs in the sense of a weapon in corpora with violence verbs. But our more prototypical sense of this word, at least intuitively, is of a tool. So her question is, is frequency always corresponded to prototypical meaning? No, it's not. Um, <laughs> so there, there's always, I mean, ever since, you know, that kind of Roche work and then discussions about this in cognitive linguistics, you know, many articles by Taylor and others, you know, I mean, frequency has always been involved in that definition of prototypicality as, you know, a, a first quick and dirty approach, quick and dirty fix, so to speak, to that question. Uh, but it's, um, I'm not gonna say never, you know, but it's probably never ever uh, gonna be enough. Uh, so we do need more criteria than that. Um, and so uh, there's a variety of things one could look at uh, in addition to frequency. Uh, you know, one would be, uh, you know, the distribution uh, I mean, the distribution of the senses of a word together with other words in the context. Um, uh, there are things like, you know, marketness uh, considerations that might be used uh, to use corpus data for determining prototypical status of, let's say, a sense. And then there's, you know, data from other kinds of corpora that sometimes can help. Uh, okay, so, uh, for example, uh, there's been discussions about how uh, you know, a lot of times for many concrete items, for instance, like screwdriver, um, the prototypical sense often is the one that children, you know, acquire first, right? So if you look at language acquisition corpora, you know, then uh, you might find that the tool sense, you know, might be, a, might be acquired earlier than the weapon sense, let's hope, <laughs> you know, so things like that. So there's a, there's a variety of different ways in which corpus data can be brought to bear on this, but um, I completely agree that frequency on its own uh, you know, is not something, at least, well, I would say that I certainly would never rely on frequency alone as the main diagnostic. Okay. Um, Andrea asks another question. She asks, why only punctuation marks as features and why random forests as opposed to other models? Um, <clears throat> so the, the choice of feature well, so let me actually start with the random forest one because that's easier. Um, one could have done other things as well. Um, so I, <clears throat> I use random forests here because, uh, the, because of the distribution characteristics of the input data, essentially. So the data were of a kind where, uh, you know, I suspected that, uh, let's say, you know, mixed effects modeling or something like that. So, so like parametric approaches that assume particular distributions that they would cause problems for that because uh, some of the data were really sparse. Of course, some of the features didn't show up in text at all. Uh, so in order to avoid any kinds of, uh, you know, issues that might, uh, that might result from forcing regression modeling techniques on a data set that doesn't really say, you know, model me with that. Um, I just wanted to avoid that. And so I find random forests um, uh, are often a, a good alternative. Um, they, um, and that's one thing. Uh, second thing, so in comparison to regression modeling, um, well, let's put it this way. Uh, so you can classify, you can classify predictive modeling approaches according to, I mean, minimally, you know, like two dimensions, one being, you know, quality of the results, I mean, predictive accuracy, and the other one, interpretability. And so regression models do really well on interpretability because in general, you know, it's relatively straightforward. You visualize a slope, you visualize a difference of means and you know what it says, you know. Um, but in terms of predictive accuracy, you know, regression modeling often actually does worse uh, than other kinds of approaches that are, you know, more black boxy in nature, if you will. So things like, uh, things like uh, boosting, support vector machines or random forests, you know, a variety of machine learning techniques, you know, do better a lot of times. Their disadvantage though for research at least is uh, that the results can be much harder to interpret, okay? But now the thing in this application that I talked about, you know, I didn't need to understand why the algorithm picked, you know, that author over the, predicted this author over that author or something like that. All I was interested in is, you know, well, what does it predict? 
you know, I didn't need to explain later why. A judge doesn't want to read, you know, and then I did this graph and it shows blah, blah. The judge wants to know, you know, what does it say? Okay, and so uh, that coupled with the fact that, you know, some of these machine learning techniques are actually doing better than regression modeling, you know, made me go with random forest because it's a relatively well-established technique. Uh, its accuracies are generally very high. They are prediction accuracies right out of the box because they return out of back prediction accuracies. Uh, so all these kinds of practical considerations made me use those over, you know, let's say something like regression modeling or something like that. Now, in terms of features, uh, so why punctuation mark features? Um, so when I read the PDFs uh, that were given to me, you know, the ones that were subpoenaed, um, it's, there, there were certain idiosyncrasies in the writing that, that struck me as, well, as, you know, out of the ordinary. Um, and so the, it was basically, so the, the choice of the features was basically based on, uh, you know, uh, prior exploration. So things that might, uh, that might be relevant, uh, that might be able to distinguish things. And then um, I actually did, I mean, I did, I glossed over this here, you know, but so I actually did uh, two kinds of analyses for that. And so one was using only the features that when I read the subpoenaed stuff, you know, struck me as noteworthy, which of course is already doing kind of a pre-selection, right? Because you're singling out particular features. And so, uh, and so someone might say, you know, well, but you know, that's like, I mean, cheating is a strong word, you know, but that's like, okay, you're kind of pre-training the data already by selecting things you already noticed. Um, and so then what I did is in a second analysis, I added uh, an additional set of punctuation features that had not struck me as, you know, abnormal in the plaintiff's writing and added those to see whether that would change the random forest prediction. So I tried to basically level the playing field uh, but the results were the same. Uh, so again, all 205 lines uh, were predicted to be the ones written by the customer. Uh, but, you know, obviously, you know, one could use a whole bunch of other uh, things as well. The thing um, that in this case, you know, I particularly liked about um, punctuation marks is that, you know, for a lot of people, when they're not, let's say, trained writers or, you know, like very well-schooled writers, is that punctuation is, for many people, it's kind of under the radar, you know, they don't pay attention to it much. So, I mean, this was a case where the customer, the plaintiff was, you know, actively trying to, you know, let a certain business look really bad. And the plaintiff tried to do that with, I mean, if I, if my analysis is correct, you know, who knows. Um, the plaintiff tried to do that, you know, with already various fake names and stuff like that. So you know, if, if the analysis was right, you know, there was already, uh, an effort, you know, to mask who did something. And so people might easily, you know, switch around words or something like that because they, they might say, you know, okay, I'm not gonna use this, you know, because I wanna vary things up a little bit, you know, but again, punctuation, that's something that, you know, a lot of times goes completely under the radar. People, I mean, people use a lot of like literal motor memory when they use that, uh, you know, without much conscious control. It's, it's just something that people don't pay attention to. And, you know, maybe one of the best examples for this, uh, you know, is something that I see all the time when I co-author with people. Um, so they send me a document, uh, you know, let's say a Word document or something like that. And I mean, I bet you will all know this uh, or have seen something like this, you know. So there's this thing that people write a sentence, you know, and if it's the last sentence of a paragraph, you know, then there's, okay, the sentence ends in a period, but then people still put a space after that before they do the next paragraph. Okay, the space there doesn't do anything. It's not needed, uh, you know, but it's just motor memory. People are so used to pressing the period key and then the space key that even if the next one is a paragraph so that space key wouldn't be necessary, they still do it. Okay, so that just shows that, you know, that kind of stuff is so, so much, you know, unconsciously ingrained that I, I thought, you know, okay, this is gonna be something good, especially for a case where someone might otherwise be trying to hide their identity in writing. Okay, now uh, a question from Irene Checa. She says, Professor Grease, uh, would you expect nucleus position to affect differently in languages with different word order, nucleus position frequencies? <clears throat> um, in different. I, 
I'm not sure, to be honest, um, because I mean, I'm not sure what to expect, uh, frankly. I mean, it would be, I mean, it's an empirical question and I can't, I don't feel confident to make a prediction there. I mean, the, the thing is that I, I do think there will be, I mean, I do think it's likely to find, you know, similar curved effects like this, if only, you know, for things that have to do with, for instance, syntactic structures and stuff like that. So, I mean, the nucleus is often going to be, you know, a content word, which might be followed by some other content words followed by maybe some structural words. If the nucleus is at the beginning, so it gets a high degree of emphasis, so it's the most important thing, then that means you know, several unimportant things, some of which might be closed class words or something like that will follow. So that will naturally lead to a, a speeding up process, uh, you know, even if it doesn't have anything to do with turn final lengthening or something like that. But if then turn final lengthening were to happen at the end, I would still, I mean, to the extent that that is a, a phenomenon that we can find in many other languages, you know, one would ex again find the slowing down effect. So I do think some sort of curved uh, effects like that will likely be found. What their exact shape is, whether they will all be able to, uh, whether it's going to be possible to capture them all with just, you know, a simple curve or whether we need something more advanced than that, um, that is very difficult to say. Um, yeah, especially, you know, because the, um, you know, our turns all have the same length, uh, right? So that already, you know, biases, I mean, has a, or in, in, implies a certain bias, you know, on certain kinds of sentences, on certain kinds of syntactic, uh, syntactic structures and so on. Once you look at sentences, you know, or turns that only have five words, you know, obviously that constrains uh, the amount of things that can happen there quite a bit. And so uh, in cases like that, the, the duration development, so to speak, over the course of a turn will be very different. So I think that's, I mean, that's essentially why I think it's so difficult to make any predictions there, you know, because the kind of method we did so far has been, you know, very, I mean, very much focusing on only one particular turn length. So it's, I mean, it's an interesting question, but I, given what we've done so far, you know, I think it's, it would be very dangerous to make a clear prediction here. Okay, uh, Libio Shiro has a couple of methodological questions. Um, could you talk a little more about how the data was organized, tagged, annotated in the turn, fine, in the turn final lengthening study before extracting measurements and coding? For example, what would be necessary if one was to replicate this study? Um, um, I'm, I'm not sure I complete, I mean, the, the variables that were annotated, I mean, were the ones that, that I discussed, right? So we, I mean, length, frequency, surprisal, part of speech, um, the word itself, the speaker, blah, 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 all these kinds of things. So. Um, I mean, many of these obviously were taken from the BNC. So we worked with the BNC's word annotation for better or for worse, which also gave us the part of speech annotation. Um, we, I mean, we did make several annotation decisions, you know, but I, I'm not sure you want to, I mean, you're asking about these special kinds of things. I mean, to give you one example, you know, for instance, for the parts of speech, uh, as you may know, the BNC has, you know, so-called portmanteau tags. Uh, so uh, in the interest of reducing uh, the number of levels that we had there, for instance, we at some point decided to go uh, to basically eliminate the part of portmanteau tags and only go, you know, with the first three letters of the tag, which means, you know, uh, we went with the best guess. Okay, if there was a second one, we discarded that one, we went with the first, uh, because otherwise, you know, the number of levels uh, that the mixed effect modeling process would have to accommodate, you know, uh, became too big for us in order to think that that would still work very well. But um, again, I mean, the, the features that we annotated, you know, were the ones I discussed. I'm not sure what do you what you mean by, you know, what how those were annotated or something like that. It's not quite clear to me. I'm sorry. She is uh, clarifying her question and she's saying the corpus was annotated in Parat, if not mistaken. So yes. her question is, was the transcription segmented by word? Um, well, so we had a transcription that, you know, let me maybe share this real quick here. Uh, and that's, I'm going to try and bring back this graph with the nucleus. Um, okay, second. 
<clears throat> All right, so uh, this is uh, this is kind of what we. I mean, this is one uh, screenshot you know that we worked with uh, that my co-author uh, did when uh, <clears throat> when he annotated the data like this. So we had you know this is one particular turn. We had the segmenting of the. I mean, so using the audio data, then the the turn was segmented into the different uh, word slots, you know, like that. And then from that, uh, and so that was exported into sort of this text grid kind of thing from Prat so that we could compute from that the lengths. Um, I don't know if that's okay with you to, to answer a few more questions. Okay, um, uh, Livia also asks, as for authorship, how much material is necessary to be able to build an adequate model? Are there predictors, spelling, idiosyncrasies that are generally more robust than others? Uh, it's the usual question, how much data do you need? Um, let me give the usual answer, you know, I don't know, uh, because, <clears throat> Well, because it depends. I mean, you, you it's if, it's extremely hard to say to give anything more than very broad rules of thumb uh, about this kind of stuff. And so the reason is, you know, like how we say in my classes, you know, I mean, you if you look at if you look at something and the effect is like super obvious and super consistent, you know, well then yeah, you don't need a lot of data, right? I mean, if if there's an extremely clear patterning, like you know, one author always does this and never the opposite, and the other author you know, never does the opposite, but always the other thing, you know, well, yeah, then you have 20 data points, 10 from each might be enough, you know, to have a model see that, you know, I mean, the, the, the tricky thing is, you know, what if the effect is a little bit weaker, uh, you know, question one, second question, what if the effect is, you know, tainted or by other things or is more variable, right? So what if the difference is, it's still a 60, uh, there's a certain percentage difference, you know, but the percentages of the two authors are closer to each other, but in the different files for each of the authors, th there's also a lot of variability, right? I mean, that's what significance tests react to, right? The, the, I mean, the same difference, like in a t-test, the same difference in means will be significant if it comes with small variances and it will be insignificant when it comes with high variances, right? And so, so the question of, you know, like how many data points uh, or how much data do you need, you know, will depend in part on, you know, your selection of features and, you know, how, how much discriminatory power they have within and between uh, the files or texts, you know, that you have for each of these authors. And then the, the main rule of thumb, of course, is that, you know, anything, uh, anything that works, you know, maybe on, uh, you know, a lexical level, you know, that can be tricky uh, because, you know, so if you're going with favorite words or something, then a lot of that kind of previous work goes with function words because, you know, everything else and the kind of small, uh, small letters or something like that that you get in these kinds of cases, you know, is not going to be frequent enough, right? That's one other reason why people might go, for instance, with, you know, tag frequencies. Those will be more frequent, right? Because all the nouns get the same tag, even if every individual noun is used very infrequently. So, you, you kind of have to figure into your decision, you know, okay, I mean, how much data do I have? How clearly do I expect the predictors to make a difference there? And, you know, what kind of predictors will I choose? Will they be ones that are attested reasonably frequently uh, or not? And, you know, if your data set is pretty small, then, you know, going with something lexical uh, might not be the greatest idea, you know, because it's more likely that it's doomed to, to fail than something that works on the level of a unit that is more frequent. Okay, so one final question from Andrea Menegoto from Argentina. Uh, is R still the best software for, be, for dealing with corpus analysis? Obviously. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, obviously I think so, you know. Um, just as obviously, you know, many people are using Python. I think the number of people using Perl is decreasing rapidly um, for good reasons. Um, and so Python and R have different strengths. You know, I mean, I, I use R because, you know, the kinds of things I need to do, you know, I, they can be done very easily in R. And I like the fact 
that you know I don't need to switch to another software to continue with the statistical analysis. You know, I can use one programming language to do uh, you know the corpus retrieval. I can do parts of the corpus annotation with it, um, and I can do the statistical analysis with it, and I can do the visualization with it. And you know, if I want to, I can use R Markdown to write it all down. You know, so I I'm basically lazy. You know, I'm sticking to one language that does it all. Why would I? waste time on learning another programming language that allows me to do the exact same thing that I can already do in another one. Okay, now that being said, uh, you know, if you are interested, you know, in a data science kind of career or something like that, then I think, you know, knowing both obviously is an advantage, right? Because uh, for a lot of applications, you know, Python, uh, I mean, Python programming might be more frequent um, and so if you can do R and Python at the same time, you know, that would be great. Um, yet again, you know, I do find that, for instance, some of the deep learning kinds of things that are being, uh, that many people are working with right now, you know, word embeddings, glove, word to back, all that kind of stuff, uh, spacey, you know, all these kinds of things probably came out of non-R first, you know, I mean, were developed using Python and other kinds of programming languages, but by now you can use them all in R because, you know, people have written packages that make them accessible. And so, um, you know, like I said, where I'm coming from, you know, I can do everything I want with R. So um, I think it's a strong programming language that, you know, I mean, you have to do a whole lot of stuff before you hit the limits there. Let's put it that way. Okay, so I thank you one more time for your lecture and your participation. Um, again, I thank Tradu Points for the simultaneous translation. And uh, I want to thank you all in the audience for your participation and encourage you to continue to follow and support the series of lives, Abrilinho Vivo Linguists Online. Join our live transmissions, ask questions, leave comments, and promote the series among your colleagues. Your involvement is fundamental. Uh, so, Professor Grease, would you like to say any final words for, for us to wrap, wrap up? Um, not really, no. Thanks. I mean, thanks for listening. Thanks for sticking uh, for the whole time and uh, having some interesting questions. Okay. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye -bye. Take care.